was uh, present when Dale was born in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> Starting to feel old. And this uh, young fellow here, he is a young fellow. He lost his hair when he was two. <laughs> Matt was in our very first uh, class of students when we began the school 20 years ago. And so he is uh, one of our very first graduates. And he is currently working at the uh, Pickerington Church in uh, Pickerington, Ohio, near Columbus. And uh, he graduated from Ohio University in 1991 and uh, uh, graduated from the School of Preaching in 1997. That's the second year. Second year, man. Uh, he and his wife, Monica, have three children, Colton, 22, Taylor, 19, and Amelia, 15. And uh, Matt was a good student while he was in school, and we appreciated him and his family very much. And uh, recently I was up on Fork Ridge where he used to live, and I thought about him when we passed by there. <laughs> Matt? Good afternoon to you. It's been a couple years since I've been up here. It's been nearly 20 since I came here in the first place. I wasn't going to call you out on that, but it was the second year. We were here with first year students, though, and we met over in the third and fourth grade classroom, right over there in the hallway. There was, that was the outfield, and we'd go out at recess. <laughs> And get some energy out, sitting in those classes all day. We had to get a little out, so we hit some tennis balls around and threw the baseball around. And we didn't tell Denver about all the times we hit his house. <laughs> but uh, it must have done enough damage, they turned it into a dorm. That's what you do <laughs> with old buildings. I'm privileged to be assigned the task of John 13, verses 1 through 17. And I'd like you to turn there with me. We're going to read that text together. It's hard to get the import of it unless you just read this narrative, this discussion, this part of the this part of the book and this part of his life, just this evening, encompasses several chapters of the book of John, a larger portion of it. And so uh, it's there's many great things that happen on the eve of the Lord's arrest. This last evening as a free man, in that sense, and he teaches his disciples many valuable truths. He prayed a great prayer this evening. He was betrayed this evening by Judas. And in the morning he would carry his cross outside the camp like a scapegoat, up Calvary's mountain to bear the sins of humanity in his own body on the tree. So the clock is ticking. Time is winding down. And up until this narrative, John records several great miracles, only a few compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but encompassing God's sovereignty and God's power, and each one of them seemingly directing his power to the people to understand that he is Lord of all. And so what will he say to them as they sit down to this last meal together, the Passover? What will he say to them? What's he going to leave them with? Well, he could impress upon them, I suppose, a great demonstration of judgment to instill some fear in them until he comes. After all, he is putting the weight of this message on these men to go out into the world, and he might want to hold them accountable. He might strike some fear into their hearts. He might uh, begin planning a political insurrection for that evening or that morning and leave the apostles in power in Jerusalem so they really would carry the authority with this message over all the people. He could oust the Romans from Palestine, bring in the death angel from the 10th plague and 
leave them all lying in the morning to be found and have all the people fear God that way. But he doesn't do it that way. Interestingly, as we read here in John chapter 13, that Jesus, in verse 1, he knew that his time to depart this world had come. He's going to depart from the Father, it says, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. That's an important phrase. Now, how's he going to do that? And supper being ended, the devil already having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Sounds reminiscent of his discussion with Nicodemus and concerning the eating of his flesh and blood. You have no part with me if you do not do this. So Peter says, Lord, verse 9, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. No great miracle here, is there, Steve? But there's some pure religion, is there not? With Jesus injected into it together as we learned in the previous hour. He loved them to the end. He, as Paul wrote in Philippians 2, verses 7 through 9, humbled himself, made himself of no reputation, taking on the, for the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men here. And he said, you'll understand what I'm doing after this. And then he asked them, do you know what I've done to you? And then he told him, I've given you an example. If you know this, and I think he was capping that preview, you'll know after this. Now, if you know this, that I've given you an example, that you should serve one another as I have served you, your Lord serving his servant, then blessed are you if you do this. Blessed are you if you do this. That's interesting also. Not blessed is everyone whom you come into contact with and serve. Blessed are you if you do this. I'm going to visit that here in a minute. Albert Schweitzer once said, There's no higher religion than human service. To work for the common good is the greatest creed. Well, he captured the importance of that. And I think in our culture and in our society, there are many people who understand the importance of servanthood. I think there are many people who understand that it's a wonderful attribute of the human race. And that it is the greatest good. But if we miss that this is the purest expression of God's love to us, then those acts of service, those works that men do, will all be for naught. We won't be able to save ourselves by them. We won't be able to 
wash anyone's sins away by washing feet. And so we have to understand that God has given us this for it to bear any fruit as we serve. Jesus had taught them in Mark 10, 45, that he did not come to be served, but to serve. He also said, a servant is not greater than his master, but every disciple who is perfectly trained shall be like his master. And so he set the stage for them to follow his lead. You know what's interesting? Just this morning as I was rereading the text, freshening it up for my lesson today, Something dawned on me. I was looking at the context as well. And, you know, it's just a few minutes later that Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. I don't think Philip was too flattered by the foot washing. Why don't you show us the Father? And the divine reply was from the Lord. He said, if you had known me, you'd know the Father. And if you've seen me, Philip, you've been with me this long, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What you just witnessed when I was washing your feet was as vivid a portrayal of the Father in heaven as you can get. Philip would rather have had some vision, some power shown to give him that reassurance in his faith as they're getting ready to let him go and begin this great ministry. You see, it didn't flatter him any more than it does us when we come to think this is what the Lord's will for us is. It's not to be greater than our Lord and not even to consider ourselves greater than others, but to consider others above our own selves, as the apostle Paul wrote. Hmm. Serving is a lifestyle of the one who loves God. I might even say serving is the life of the one who loves God. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, consider this about Jesus. How would you answer this? Was serving something Jesus did, or was it something he lived? Was serving a quality of his, or was it his nature? By washing the disciples' feet, did he give us something to do or something to become? You see the difference? He's teaching us who we ought to be, not just what we need to do. We are to be like him. And this was the last impression he wanted to leave with his disciples. The humility in service, the humility in it, is that it requests nothing in return. There's, there's nothing in it for me from men. And it's simply that, that which is my duty to do because of what my master has done for me. There's, there's really no demand in return for it. It's self-sacrificial. It's agape, love. Jesus tells a story to illustrate. He exemplified in the upper room, but he illustrates what it means to love the Lord your God with all you have and to love your neighbor as yourself in that great epic story about the Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. He tells this story in response to a question that was asked him about what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, he could have said a lot of things. Could have said Mark 16, 16, right? John 3, 3 through 5. He could have answered that in a lot of ways right there, but he saw what this man needed, and he responded with this illustration. And behold, it says there in verse 25 of Luke 10, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, What must, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law? What's your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've rightly answered, do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself, 
He got his answer, didn't he? But he wanted to justify himself, and he said to Jesus, Who's my neighbor? And Jesus answered him and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him and passed, uh, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, in the service of God, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise, and you shall inherit eternal life. The flow of the lesson to receive eternal life here is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself played out through servanthood. That is how it looks. That's the appearance of it on the outside. These are the works by which we will be known. These are the fruits by which people will know you and I. And as Jesus said, later in this chapter we're studying, that all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. How do we do that? He just showed them here in these first verses of the chapter. The apostles finally got the message, I think, because... They stopped, it seems, at least on the record, bickering about who would be the greatest and eventually became servant preachers, ministers of the gospel, not just vocally proclaiming but setting forth examples so clearly that the Apostle Paul could say, imitate me as I imitate the Lord. And Paul wasn't even sitting here at this time. He got it. The others did too. When you read the first Thessalonian letter, in the first chapter, we read about their approach to ministry. And for those of us in the ministry, this is vital, vital information. Nor did we seek glory from men, Paul said, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, and laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, as a mother, as a father, Hmm. that you should walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, You welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. You received it to work in you as we have shown you an example. I think that they got it. And then the Thessalonians became followers of us, Paul said, and of the Lord, so that they did not have to say anything in Macedonia and Achaia, to the people there. That was not on the top of their traveling priority list because these people got that servant message and the boldness to teach the gospel and preach the gospel with that ministry. They said, we don't even need to come there. 
We've heard about your work. We've heard about the power of your example and that the Lord is being portrayed there beautifully so that people are coming to the Lord. I think that humility of service showed up in them. If anyone had the credentials to speak on humility, it was Paul. He was humiliated when he found out he was dead wrong about who the Lord was. I often wonder what he thought and prayed during those three days, but we can probably guess. It involved a lot of apology, a lot of humility. And then he turns to Timothy, the young Timothy, later in his ministry and says, Timothy, in chapter 2, verse 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 and 26, he says, Timothy, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. This is powerful. It will release people from the power of sin when you approach your ministry as a humble servant, not making demands as apostles or as uh, authorized preachers of the word, Timothy having ability to perform miracles could have made demands upon that. He said, no, approach them in humility. It's the most powerful representation of Christ that we've been given. As you can see, the concepts of salvation, love, and servanthood are intimately tied together, aren't they? When you're talking about one, you're talking about the other. In fact, I'd like to be so bold as to run a little test with you. Plug a different word into 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8 with me. That great piece on love. Let's take the word love and just replace it with serve or service or servanthood for a minute. Just see if it sounds right. I mean, there's a lot of words you could put in there just would not read right. Just see if this makes sense from what we're studying and what we're learning about what Jesus teaches here. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not serve, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but do not serve, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but do not serve, it profits me nothing. A servant suffers long and is kind. A servant does not envy. A servant does not parade himself. A servant is not puffed up. A servant does not behave rudely. A servant does not seek his own. A servant is not provoked. A servant thinks no evil. A servant does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Servants bear all things, believe all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Servanthood never fails. Does that work for you? I think that fits. It never fails. It, it won't fail God. God will not be disappointed in servanthood in the name of Jesus. It will not fail your spouse when you serve your spouse. It won't fail your children when you are a servant to your children. It won't fail your brethren you'll gladly receive your service. It won't fail your friends or your acquaintances or complete strangers like that Samaritan and his new acquaintance that he met along the roadside. It won't disappoint, it won't fail ever. There's a great irony too I wanna to share you, with you about the humility of service. Service frees men. Bond service, slavery to God, actually frees men. Isn't that one of those great ironies of the scripture? Let's see how that works. Beginning with the servant himself and pulling in this idea that when Jesus said in John 1, 17, blessed are you 
if you do these things. Our service toward God frees us from the restraints of having to please men. I've had people tell me oftentimes it's hard to please God, and I said it's a lot harder to please men. And we don't think about it that way sometimes unless you really start discussing it. Oh, it's harder to please men. You, you can't satisfy men. Well, I feel like I can't satisfy God. You can satisfy God. Men will never quit demanding who they think you ought to be. They'll, the standard is never the same from one to the other. Everyone has expectations of you, but when you become a servant of Christ, you're freed from the restraints of having to live like people think you should live. In a book called The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster suggests that servanthood releases you from the terrible burden of always having to get your own way. That is a burden. And I have the mindset that I've got to get my own way. I'm never at peace because I never always get all my, my way all the time. It never happens where I get my way all the time. He says it releases that burden from you. When men are servants, they're less likely to be drawn away by their own desires and enticed. James chapter 1. Which leads men into sin through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's us trying to get our way and not being servants. Servants are free also to love unconditionally. We're free to love unconditionally. We're free from competition with others. We're therefore free to rejoice with those who rejoice and not feel threatened by other people's successes. We're free to weep with those who weep, not fearful of our vulnerability. We're free to defer persecution toward us into God's hands for retribution and not feeling the need that I must step out against this person and repay. Servanthood defers to the master to take care of them. We're set free from bitterness of self-pity. We're set free to drop a matter, and yes, not even to pick it up to begin with. We're free from that because I'm not fighting for my own way anymore. I'm simply trying to please the master and so, in essence, you free yourself. Martin Luther wrote once also, A Christian man is the most free lord of all, a subject to none. A Christian man is also the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. His statement may well have been influenced by Paul's inspired discourse in 1 Corinthians 9 on the liberty of a Christian. What is my reward then, Paul said, then, that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. For though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as without law, or uh, excuse me, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. And to those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who were without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Paul, the one who said, I don't count my life dear to myself in the book of Acts, is demonstrating that here. I've let go of the need to have to force people to do things my way, and I'm going to camouflage myself into the lives of people as a servant to win them to Christ. That insolent man sure had a heart change on the road to Damascus, didn't he? Paul was free from all men, and that only one was the true Lord of him. But he willingly made himself a servant to all that he might win more souls. And ultimately, this is God's desire, that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That is the great umbrella that this fits under. Why servanthood? It is the 
the mode. It is the, the manner. It is the means by which God's love can translate into people's lives and hearts and change them. It's transforming power is undeniable. I personally am the recipient of the blessings of many servants who have shaped my thinking, my life, my destiny. It's the least I can do. It's the duty that I have to try to impress others with that same love that I've been shown. Don't you feel the same way? A servant also frees others. A freed servant has a powerful influence on others beside himself. Jesus did not demand to be served. Due to his lofty status as the son of God or his perfect conduct as a man, Servanthood isn't restrained by position or status or power. He was the last one on earth whom men would expect to put on a towel. And yet he chose to serve. His position, status, and power made his action that much more powerful. You see, there's the power in it. It's when it's least expected that it's the greatest preparation for the gospel message to enter the hearts of men. It's when it's not expected of you. And that's why any servant of the Lord can share the gospel and can minister the gospel because they can put on a towel. This is indeed what makes it so powerful. And yet, hoping for a great return and that those served will see and follow Jesus through our example. Let me give you an example of a man who I believe was converted largely due to servants that he was introduced to. I came to this by happenstance. In preparing for another lesson, I kept seeing this recurring theme, Onesimus, that runaway slave of Philemon, who in running from slavery ended up running right into it. And to free himself, getting as far away from Colossae and Philemon as he could, he ran smack into a group of bond servants who acted like they were free from all men and all things. It blew his mind. Onesimus, a slave of the convert, a Christian man named Philemon, ran away and ran right into it. Didn't expect it at all. And let me tell you some people he met. He met Paul in chains in a Roman prison, Philemon 13. He had appealed to Caesar, Paul had, and there was awaiting his trial, but he found favor in the eyes of the Romans there, and rather than being housed as a common criminal, the apostle was permitted to live in his own rented apartment for a couple of years. Though probably bound with a chain and in the company of a guard, he must have had great impact on Onesimus. Through a little detective work, you can find out from the letters that Paul dictated to the Ephesians, the Philippians, the Colossians, and also to Philemon during this two-year period just what else Onesimus witnessed when he came to Paul in that Roman prison. He would have met Luke, the great physician, the Greek physician, <laughs> the Greek physician, who enjoined himself to the apostle, apostle Paul to care for his physical infirmities and those of his travel companions. He stayed with Paul until his final days of the second Roman imprisonment. Read about that in 2 Timothy 4. And what a moving sermon it must have been to see that Christian doctor, a free man, having left his home and livelihood and all the comforts of it, perhaps, to tenderly care for Paul and his companions as they traveled about preaching the gospel. He'd have met Luke. He'd have met Epaphras, a fellow Colossian who was always laboring fervently in prayer for the Colossian brethren, which would have included Philemon, Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. If he was acquainted with Epaphras in their coming in and out during that time, he would have heard this man pray for the Colossians, his home people, perhaps even for Philemon, but he would have been thinking, he's praying 
for the well-being of the people I ran from, from the situation I ran from. He had heard Epaphras thanking God fervently in prayer for them, one of which would have been his old master. He met Timothy, apparently a gentle young man who developed a lion's heart. And about him, Paul said, I have no one like-minded as a son with his father who served with me in the gospel. He went where he was needed, including Ephesus and Philippi. And though the work wasn't easy, he had also been imprisoned himself at some point, it seems, from the Hebrew letter in chapter 13. And Timothy was Paul's staunchest soldier and right-hand man. Onesimus would have taken some great lessons, don't you think, from him in gentleness and humility, but also in bravery and faithful service to the master. I could speak of Aristarchus and Tychicus as well. Let me mention John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. He had started out with Barnabas and Saul on that first missionary journey, but along the way at Perga and Pam Pamphylia, he left them and returned to Jerusalem. Shook the confidence of the apostle in him. And so later, when he and Barnabas were going to set out on their second journey, Barnabas said, let's take John Mark. Paul said, no, I don't want it. I don't want to do that. I think he's trustworthy. But we find later that Paul is commenting in Philemon, that he is a fellow worker with him who is useful to me, 2 Timothy 4, in the ministry. Interestingly, that's what Onesimus means, useful. Timothy's name meant useful, or was useful, and Onesimus means useful. John Mark's story must have been very special to him. A deserter who runs away but is given another chance to redeem himself in the Lord. Redemption in Christ. Forgiveness from God and from men. Another very personal and powerful sermon for Onesimus. You see, he's observing these things as he's around these servants, and his heart is softening. And so when Paul proposes to him that I'm going to send you back to Philemon, what at the first may have sounded like a crazy idea. No, I, I ran away from this. Now his heart is open to it. He understands now that freedom can be found in service to Christ and that he could actually go back as a bondservant to Philemon and be free from all men and have joy in his heart and actually serve with his master in the Lord. Oh, the things he heard, but the things he saw. Powerful sermons with his eyes in people who were servants. <laughs> this isn't to mention Epaphroditus who worked himself nearly to death for Paul and continued on. He had not yet met servants like this with a godly spirit. In his complaining and dissatisfaction, he probably also shared some complaints with others, but now he's hearing men serving that are fired up about being servants, unpaid. Until this time, he hadn't met the church. I think the reason that not all Christians are at peace is because perhaps, though they may have put the Lord on in baptism, clothed themselves with Christ, but they may not have put on a towel. In fact, I've often thought of the clothing of Christ as a Christian as a white robe, but you know those come later. I don't really know what kind of garments the Lord was wearing, a seamless one-piece garment, I know, but I mean, what, what does this figuratively look like for me? Well, I think we just found our answer to that. To be clothed with Christ first, I think he would hand you a towel. White robes come in Revelation. This is how we come close to God's heart. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. This is how a servant is blessed if he does those things which Jesus has given to him. What Jesus gave them in the upper room was the second greatest gift, I guess, that he could have given them, the first being the giving of his body the following day upon the tree. The second greatest gift, maybe, was this gift of a servant life, 
They just didn't know it at the time yet. He gave them the secret to a quality of life as well. It's the greatest expression of God's love to us, and so in turn it's the greatest expression of our love toward our neighbor, is to serve and expect nothing in return. It persuades men's hearts, and ironically it sets them free. The only men, it's been said, who cannot be enslaved are those who volunteer to be slaves. And you cannot rob a man, another said, of his life if he gives it to you. His spirit is free from bondage, free to live and free to die. And in this land of the free, there are many men enslaved to sin, are there not? In this good land, unless they become servants of Christ... The world desperately needs to see free men who have been voluntarily offered to the service of the Lord and slaves of Christ who live as free. For this is the will of God, Peter said, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. For you, brethren, are called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, But through love, serve one another, Paul said in Galatians 5. I'm persuaded, in closing, that if Jesus were to grace us with his presence today, even here at this lectureship, in the midst of a crowd of devoted Christian teachers and preachers and lovers of truth, and give us one glimpse of his glory, I'm convinced that he would put a towel on and begin to wash feet or some other form of service. I believe that's what he would do first. What would you think of him then? Would you say, Lord, you shall never wash my feet, or would you say, not only my feet, but also my head and my hands? I hope that you would be immersed in him, literally and figuratively, like Peter wanted to be when he turned and gave his all to the Lord's service from that night forward. And that's our invitation to you at this time, too, if you are not a Christian and you want to become one. If you want to be free, become a servant of the Lord. Let's have an invitation song.